down at the cross. And Jewel is going to come up and share about this next song. Joe's a little under the weather today, uh, but he left me the uh, hymnal narrative, so let's do it. This one's about hymn number 227, Down at the Cross. Elisha Albright Hoffman was uh, from Pennsylvania, was, was born in Pennsylvania to Pastor Mrs. Francis Hoffman. At an early age, Elisha accepted Christ as his Savior and never lost his faith during his entire life. He attended the Philadelphia Public Schools, studied science, and then studied the classics at Union Seminary of the Evangelical Association. When Elisha was 24, the war between the states had been raging for almost two years, and he made the decision to join the Union Army, and on July 9, 1863, enlisted with Company A Infantry of Pennsylvania. After the war, in about 1866, he married Susan Orwig, and over the next seven years, their family grew to three young boys, as Elisha was or ordained by the Presbyterian Church. In 1876, after a, br a, bl a brief illness, his beloved wife Susan passed away, leaving him and the three young lads alone. Even though Elisha Hoffman had never formally trained in music, he managed to write over 2,000 hymns and songs, providing both the words and the tune for most of them. He also insisted in compiling and editing 50 songbooks. Some of the hymns you might recognize. Are you washed in the blood? Glory to his name. Have thine own way, Lord. We all know that one. What a fellowship and leaning on the everlasting arms. In early 1879, at the age of 40, he remarried and had an, went on to have another son, adding to the family of three other boys. At this time, he took the pastorate of Benton Harbor Presbyterian Church in, in Michigan and remained there for almost 40 years and was still preaching the gospel at 80. Elisha Hoffman lived to be 90 and died in 1929.
feet may
let's stand together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. I'm really excited. I get to see faces I haven't seen in a couple months, a couple weeks, a year. Awesome stuff. 
as you pull out your bulletins, um, there's a couple things that are not in there that I'm going to mention first. So if you have a pen and want to write them down, that's great. If you just um, don't want to do any of these things, don't write them down. So, or just pretend like you are. That's what I do. Um, so the first thing is, is we've been blessed with being able to uh, come together with some guys and build some sheds. And we have some finished work that we have to do on them. A little bit of roofing, just a little bit, and um, some painting and uh, putting all the uh, shelves in and things like that. And so I just want to say thank you to the guys that helped. But if you'd like to come help, we're going to be there not tomorrow, but Tuesday at 8 a.m. So Tuesday, 8 a.m. So I see the two guys writing it down. Great. That's, that's good. Okay, so Tuesday, 8 a.m. I'm looking forward to seeing you all there um, to help us finish out the sheds. The other announcement that did not get in the bulletin is there will be no um, morning Bible study for the women tomorrow morning uh, on the 16th, and there won't be any study on the 23rd, okay? So basically, just don't go to the morning Bible study for the month of February, and then uh, March, they'll start up a new series, and they'll be back together the first Monday of March, all right? And then... um, I should have wrote down the other one. I don't remember what the other one was. I'll get to it. I'll figure it out. Okay, and then this Saturday, the youth car wash is taking place. Um, Oh, there it is. I put it in the slides. Supper for six. That was the other one I missed. Sorry, Rose. Um, So there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for the month of March. So if you're like, well, I already signed up twice this year already. Well, if you'd like to do it again, you enjoyed the first two times you did it, sign up for the month of March. Or if you're wondering what is Supper for Six, you can see Rose or you can see Jeannie um, after the service to get more information or you can ask me about that. The Youth Car Wash is this Saturday at um, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the XL gas station and all donations are going to go towards the kids' winter camp and we're looking forward to that time together. Um, The annual church dinner. How many of you guys have ever been to an annual church dinner before? Great. As you know, we, uh, we have Kendall's that caters uh, those dinners, and we have prime rib and chicken something. It's really good. That's usually what I get. And then, um, then there's a vegetarian option also for those who would like the vegetarian option. It's a great time together. The Gutierrez brothers are this amazing group. That their testimony was just incredible in and of itself about they grew up doing music. Their dad's a musician. They got saved doing uh, music in Mexico City. They're just phenomenal for two guys up here. So I encourage you to be um, join us for that. But to join us for that, you have to go and see Rose after the service and buy your tickets. This is the last day to do that. Um, we have 40 people buy last week, so we're expecting you know about another 80 to buy this week. So um, if you go ahead and buy your tickets now, that'd be awesome. Great. The women's retreat is coming up February 27th through March 1st. Mark your calendars, more registration, more information. Uh, out in the foyer. It's going to be a great time together for that. High school camp is coming up. Uh, there is room still to go, so if anyone would like to be a part of that. And then junior high camp is the following week, March 20th through 22nd. And then church in the park is going to be uh, March 29th, 10 a.m., and then we'll have flyers next week for you guys to start inviting people for that. An offering box is located in the back of the sanctuary for those who'd like to contribute to the furtherance the Christian Center Ministry, and we just want to say thank you so much for that. Why don't we go ahead and silence our cell phones at this time? I'd like to invite parents to take their children to Sunday school, and why don't we go ahead and stand and greet one another? And on that day when my strength is fail the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then
song, worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Sing like this. It's like hot potato, our, our musical chairs, that's what I meant. The music has stopped, find a seat, you know, kind of thing, just kidding. So, um, once you find your seat, looks like everyone's found a seat. Okay, good. Why don't we go and stand together once you are sitting. Yeah. 
dead in our sins. Lord, but we've been made alive. Lord, may you awaken our spirit. May people see that we've been made alive, that we've been changed from the inside out. Lord, I pray you'd speak through our pastor during this time, give him the words to share. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Thanks, you guys. Worship was awesome this morning. Yeah. Well, let's take our Bibles. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 21, and we're beginning from verse 23 today. Last week, we looked at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. As he came to the Mount of Olives, he would have had a commanding view across the Kidron Valley over to the city of Jerusalem, over to the Temple Mount where the temple stood in his day. And as he looked across, he began to weep, Luke's gospel tells us, because he could see into the future some 38 years. He could see the legions of Rome surrounding the city and so many giving their lives at that time because they did not know the time of their visitation. They had missed Jesus and his coming. And so after Jesus came down the Mount of Olives in his triumphal entry and over into the temple courtyards, he cleansed the temple. There were those that had made booths and were selling animals for sacrifice and exchanging money, ripping the people off. Uh, We find out from the first century historian Josephus that it was the high priest that owned the booths. And so here you have the people of God that are supposed to be uh, representing God to the worshipers, just uh, taking advantage of them. So Jesus, in righteous indignation, cleansed the temple. And uh, he went back to Bethany. And now it's the next day and he's come back to the temple as we're going to see. But when, when we speak of that, when the Bible speaks of that, it's talking about actually coming to the courtyards of the temple where he would teach, where the people would gather. And so as we begin from verse 23 of chapter 21, it says, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Now, the these things that they're referring to, undoubtedly, (laughs) the cleansing of the temple, you know, upsetting the apple cart, raining on the parade, stepping on their moment, however you want to word it, and the teaching that he was bringing. What authority do you have to do this? You didn't get the authority from us. You didn't go to our rabbinic schools. By what authority are you doing these things? Verse 24, but Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. That's a common teaching practice to answer a question with a question. I do it with my kids quite often. When they ask something, I will say often, well, what do you think? You know, because you're kind of pulling the answer from them because they kind of know deep down inside already. And so he is bringing a question to them here. Verse 25, the baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? Now, as he speaks of the baptism of John, he's referring to John the Baptist. He's really talking about the ministry of John. John's ministry. Did God call him to do that? Or is he just some crazy guy out there baptizing people? And the whole key with all of this is if they answered that question correctly, they would have the answer to their own question. Is John of God or not? And that would answer what authority Jesus was coming under because John was paving the way for Jesus. In fact, let's just take a minute and we'll turn over uh, three books to the Gospel of John and we'll go to chapter one. As we look at the ministry of John the Baptist. So turn over Mark Luke to John chapter one. And as we go to John chapter 1, the book so named after the Apostle John, one of the original 12 that followed Jesus, but we're speaking about John the Baptist. This was the forerunner of Jesus. So a different John that's spoken of here in the Gospel of John. And let's just take it up from verse 19 of John 1. It says, now this is the testimony of John. Notice when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem. So the the leaders of Israel are coming to ask him, who are you? 
He confessed, and this is John the Baptist. He confessed and did not deny him, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, whom are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Who am I? I'm the one paving the way for the, for the Messiah, just like Isaiah predicted. Now he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and I want to show you the verse back in Isaiah, because it's virtually identical, but notice what it says in Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, in the Hebrew, in Isaiah, Lord is in all caps because it's identifying the personal name of God. We find that name some 6,500 times in the Old Testament. It's referred to as the Tetragrammaton, the four consonants, Y-H-W-H, most popularly pronounced Jehovah, probably most accurately Yahweh. Okay, So I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Jehovah, the way of the Lord, makes straight in the desert a highway for our God. So John, who are you? I'm the one preparing the way for God to come to his people. And who came? Jesus came, right? And so we see, we piece these scriptures together and we see that God is coming and here comes Jesus, the son of God, God revealed in a human body. And so who are you? Well, I'm simply the one that's paving the way. And notice as we read on in John's gospel. Now, those who were sent were from the Pharisees. Those were the religious leaders of Israel. And they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan. John is baptizing down at the Jordan, and he's baptizing a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As the people were coming, he's preparing the way of the Lord. Get your hearts right. Get right. Be prepared because God is coming to you. He's preparing the way of Jesus. Notice that the very next verse, and then we'll move back to Matthew. John 1, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm preparing the way for him. I'm preparing the way for our God. I'm preparing the way for the Lamb who is going to take away the sin of the world. And so by what authority do you do these things? Well, let me ask you a question first. The baptism of John. Is it of heaven or of men? Was he of God or was he just a crazy guy out there in the wilderness dunking people underwater? And if they would answer that question correctly, oh, no, he's from God. Then they would have the answer to their question. By what authority are you doing these things? Because John paved the way. But they wouldn't answer it that way, would they? Because they didn't think John was from God, nor do they think that Jesus is from God. Back in Matthew chapter 21 Verse 25, the baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they, and men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, if he was of God, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. They're not really interested in answering the question honestly, are they? I mean, if they were to answer the question honestly, they would say, well, we, we think he's from men. We don't believe he's from God. But if they say that, they got a lot of people around him that believe in John. And so they're afraid of the people. And if they say, well, we really believe he's from God, then Jesus will say, then why don't you believe him? And so rather than answering honestly, they're reasoning among themselves, trying to get out of it, verse 27. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you. By what authority I do these things? You know, it would have been pointless, wouldn't it? Because they didn't believe in John, they're not going to believe in Jesus. But he's going to take this opportunity now to develop where they are at. 
as the religious leadership of Israel. They're supposed to be representing God. They're supposed to be leading the people to God, but they're missing it badly. They rejected the one whom God had sent to pave the way, John the Baptist, and now they're in the process of rejecting Jesus as well. And so we have a couple of parables that come up here. And throughout the history of Israel, we see the leadership of Israel rejecting those that God sent to them, the prophets. The prophets being sent to the leaders to try and call the people back to get their lives right with God. But, but, but in Israel's history, they repeatedly rejected God's messengers. And so they rejected John and they're rejecting the son. They're rejecting Jesus right now as well. And so he comes into a couple of parables after he says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 28. But what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Now, when you think about it, the first group said, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to work. But after, I better go, you know, so they get up and go. The other one said, yes, I will go, sir. But they never go. Which one actually did the will of the father? It would be the first one, wouldn't it? The one who at first said, no, I'm not going to do it. But okay, now I'll go. They said to him, verse 31, the first, Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Can you imagine how that felt to the religious leaders? Tax collectors, now none of us like paying taxes today, right? Back then it was all the worse because they were viewed as traitors, those who were working for Rome. So the tax collectors, you know, despised in the harlots as well. And for Jesus to say, they're going to come into the kingdom before you, the religious leadership. But you see the picture here. God comes, if you will, and says, go work in my vineyard. In other words, calling humanity to come. And the sinner, the tax collector, the harlot, it's like, no, I'm doing my own thing. But then John the Baptist comes. The message is preached. What do they do? They repent and they come to God. So at first they don't, but then they do like the first person in the parable. But the second person, the one that says, I go, sir, is like the religious leaders. Yeah, I'll be doing the work of God, but they're not doing the work of God, are they? In fact, they're not representing God accurately at all to the people. And so they're playing the hypocrite. And this is the story, the parable that Jesus is piecing together. Again, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Verse 32, for John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. They did. You didn't. When you think about it, nobody's life was right with God. When John came, there was an opportunity. And it was those who recognized they needed a savior that responded. But the religious leaders felt they were okay. And they were doing religion according to what seemed best to them. Jesus said something along the same line and, and just seems to emphasize where the religious leaders are at in Luke chapter 7, verse 29, where he said, when all the people heard him referring to John the Baptist, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And so the baptism of John, the ministry of John, is it of God or is it of man? Well, it's of God. Why didn't you listen to him then? You know, it's one thing to say the right thing. It's another thing to live it out, isn't it? For the religious leaders, they felt like they were doing God's will, but they were doing it on their terms. It's one thing to say you're a Christian. It's another thing to live it out in your life. And we're going to be talking about looking at the fruit of our lives to see if, in fact, we are planted in the vineyard, so to speak. Because that's what really, that's what really speaks. Any of us can say we're Christians. But the fruit, the proof is in the pudding, they say. <laughs> and so he tells another parable as we start looking at the fruit. In verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain land owner who planted a vineyard. 
and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and leave his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. It's like they're caught up in the story. He's saying, well, this is what he'll do when he comes, and they don't realize that it's against them. You know, when you look, especially when you look back through the Old Testament, you see that the vineyard represents, in a number of places, the nation of Israel. That Israel was God's vineyard that he brought out of slavery, out of Egypt, and planted in the promised land. And he expected fruit to be born. And so as we look at this story, it's, it's very similar to the illustrations that we see in the Old Testament. Again, you have the landowner who plants a vineyard, and he puts a hedge around it. The idea is a hedge of protection around the vineyard. And then he digs a wine press in it. And then there are the vine dressers that it's leased out to. And the servants, they come to receive the fruit. It's like rent when vintage time came. But they mistreated them and killed some of them. And then finally, the landowner said, I know, I'll send my son. They'll respect my son. But when they see the son, ah, that's the heir right there. We get rid of him and the vineyard will be ours is their train of thought. Now, Like I mentioned in the Old Testament, Psalm 80, Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 12, Ezekiel 15, Hosea 10, you see God using a vineyard to illustrate the nation of Israel, a a vineyard, God's work that he's doing in them, expecting fruit to come. And yet so often, instead of getting good grapes, he only gets rotten ones from that. I think the most famous passage that we see in the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 5 passage that's referred to as the song of the vineyard. Let's turn back there, okay? Isaiah 5. Isaiah, easiest way to get to it, if you're new. Crack your Bible, dead center in the middle, and I came to Ecclesiastes. Sometimes you come to Psalms, but Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah chapter 5. You learn these tricks as you kind of continue on down the road of... (laughs) being a Christian. Isaiah chapter 5, the song of the vineyard, and this is Isaiah speaking in the first two verses, and then it's going to switch over to to God speaking. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. So Isaiah is singing to God. He's singing to God about his beloved vineyard. Verse 2, he dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. Don't you think this sounds a little bit like what Jesus was saying? As you're kind of seeing the same thing, you've got, in this case, you've got God that's planted a vineyard. And you see that he's bringing provision into the vineyard. He's got the wine press there and, and so forth and taking care of it. Now, with the religious leaders... As Jesus is speaking this parable, don't you think that their mind is probably going back to this passage we're reading? Because they had the scroll of Isaiah available to them. Don't you think they're probably going, hey, that sounds a lot like the Song of the Vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. And so they would begin to equate the two as Jesus would put this parable together. Well, let's read on as we speak of, as it speaks of God's vineyard. So middle of verse 2, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes but it brought forth wild grapes. 
And now God speaking, verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plan. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. God's vineyard that was planted, again, Israel, out of Egypt into the promised land, planted in an area by God where they could be fruitful. God's protection around them, his supernatural provision within them. He looked for fruit. What kind of fruit? It it gives it to us right here, doesn't it? Fruits of righteousness, fruits of justice. In other words, being the people of God, doing the right thing, being fair. But what did he get? He got oppression. He got the people oppressing the people. (laughs) Now, check it out. How about the religious leaders again, back in the temple courtyards of Jesus day, how they're ripping off the people of God. God is looking for fruits of righteousness and justice, but all he is getting is oppression that's coming upon them. Throughout the ages, he got unfaithfulness as they turned to their various idols. And so what does God say he'll do? I'm going to remove their hedge. I'm going to remove that supernatural hedge of protection, my hand upon them, and they're going to be destroyed. And of course, that would be at the hands of the Assyrians, the 10 northern tribes, and the Babylonians, the two southern tribes. And so as we come to this parable in the New Testament, can you see how Jesus is painting much the same picture here? He's showing, you are the vineyard of the Lord. You're you're the people that God chose. And God did choose them, didn't he? He chose them so that he could reveal himself to them and reveal himself through them to the rest of the world so that we could know what God is like, so that we could know of God's law. So he chooses Abraham, you know, sovereignly chooses him, coming from Ur of the Chaldees and into the land of Canaan, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then they go into Egypt, and then they're brought out of Egypt by the hand of Moses into the promised land after they come to Mount Sinai to enter into covenant with God, then into the promised land under Joshua. And here it's the vineyard of the Lord that he has chosen to reveal himself to. These are God's standards given to Israel to give to the rest of the world. God revealing himself to them, ideally through them, so that we could know of God. But they, they didn't follow after God. They turned their back on him. They didn't bring forth grapes. They brought forth wild grapes. Not righteousness and justice, but they brought forth oppression and the people's cry for help. And so as Jesus brings forth this parable in Matthew 21, undoubtedly it's got to be resonating, but it's like they're caught up in the moment. You know, what is he going to do to those people that killed his son? Well, let's look at this. Who is the landowner then? If we were going to piece this together based on what we just read, let's say in the Song of the Vineyard in Isaiah 5, who's the landowner in our parable in Matthew 21? God would be the landowner. How about the vineyard? We would say, same thing, Israel, the Jewish people. The hedge, I think we could say, is God's protection. The wine press and the tower, God's provision. The vine dressers, who are they? The ones that it was leased out to. The religious leaders, very good. The servants that are sent to them to get the fruit would be the prophets, yeah. Throughout the ages, though, and we know, we think of the prophets oftentimes as, as predictive prophecy. And that's true. But a big part of their message was speaking forth the word of God. And a lot of times that word was, thus saith the Lord, get your life right with God. And so the prophets sent time and again to the leadership of Israel, but time and again, they were persecuted and they were put to death. And finally, God said he would send his son, and he did. And his son is Jesus, and what will they do? They will put him to death. And so what will God do? That was how the parable ended. What will the landowner do then to those wicked vine dressers? And as they responded in verse 41, he will destroy those wicked men miserably. And notice this, and lease his vineyard 
to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Now, log that on the middle shelf for a minute because he's going to take his vineyard, which we're looking at in Isaiah 5 as, as the nation of Israel, and we're looking at here in Matthew 21 as Israel as well, the vine dressers as the leadership. But it really, in fact, it's the work that God is doing, isn't it? He, he chose Israel to work through them, but it's the work that he's doing. So he's going to take the vineyard the work that he's doing through these people, and he's going to move it and place it into the hands of other vine dressers. And he's expecting fruit. That's the key thing right here. He's expecting fruit to come forth. What kind of fruit? Righteousness, justice, people who are being obedient to the Lord and his will as it's revealed in his word. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? And again, these are the kind of things got to hurt the religious leaders. Of course, we've read these things in the scriptures. Quote, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. It's like the metaphor has shifted a little bit. No longer talking about the vineyard in this verse and the fruit that's supposed to come from it. But now we're talking about a building and we're talking about a stone here that has been rejected. Building a building. Here's a stone. Eh, we don't need that stone. But yet this is the chief cornerstone. If we don't have this stone, the rest of the building ain't going to work. You know how it is. In fact, we were building these sheds, as Ryan mentioned. And by the way, thank you to all of those that came out. It was fun. But I tell you what, I am still hurting. You know, I'm not used to this manual labor stuff, but it's good. I know it's good for the body. But in every aspect, really, of that building, whether it's the foundation or the walls or the shingles that went on the roof, it had to get square. If it didn't get squared, everything else is going to be off. And so without the chief cornerstone, if you don't have that main stone, everything else, you're not going to have a building. The thing will crumble. Who do you think the stone is? Jesus. We read in the Old Testament, God is the rock of my salvation. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. In fact, this passage right here is quoted from Psalm 118. You know, we looked at that last week. Same chapter, chapter 21, verse 9. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You remember that from last week? That's the people crying out to Jesus as he's coming into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. Psalm 118, a messianic passage. Just a couple of verses earlier is this, the stone which the builders rejected. Now, if Jesus is the stone, who do you think the builders are? The religious leaders. If they're the wicked vine dressers that are rejecting the sun, if they're rejecting the stone, same thing, the religious leaders. How do we know that? Am I just like... Sounds good to me kind of thing. And you're going, well, maybe. You know how we can know that? Is in the book of Acts, chapter 4, Peter is brought before the religious leadership, the Sanhedrin. And he is speaking about Jesus because a lame man has just been healed. Peter's saying, we're not the ones who healed this guy. It's by the name of Jesus that this man was healed. And listen to what he says in Acts 4, 11 and 12 of Jesus. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Isn't that cool? It's like beyond the shadow of a doubt, he's identifying who the stone is and who the builders are. Jesus, the stone, the religious leaders, the builders. And then he says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you don't have the stone, you have no building. If you don't have Jesus, you have no Christianity. You have no salvation. And so for the religious leaders, again, back at this time, by what authority do these things? If we don't have Jesus, we don't have anything. And he's trying to show them that. John, he's the forerunner. Was he from heaven or from men? Oh, we don't know. Well, let me tell you a story here. John came and those whose lives were not right with God turned him around and came to God. But you religious leaders... You stayed in your pride and your stiff neck and you totally are missing it. And there's coming a day where judgment is going to fall upon you if you don't turn it around. And unfortunately, they wouldn't turn it around. Verse 43, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And of course, that time would come. Israel would fall just like they did under the Babylonians. They would fall in 70 A.D. 
both the city and the sanctuary once again would be completely destroyed. And God would begin. Notice this. Do you see this in verse 43? The kingdom of God. Now we've got the vineyard identified. The kingdom of God, the work that God is doing. Matthew 13, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a dragnet that God, so the work that God is doing and the activity that's taking place, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, the religious leaders, and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Now, what nation? Who's the nation, do you think? Just take a guess. I think so, too. I think it's the church because God is beginning to work or, or begun to work through the church at that time. Is God through with Israel then? You see, this is where people kind of get it mixed up a little bit. They say, well, God is completely through with Israel now because they rejected Jesus. But, you know, there's way too many promises in the Old Testament towards Israel. Okay, there's like this parentheses. There's like this, this holding of the pendulum and now moving and working through an entity called the church made up of Jews and Gentiles where he is revealing himself to and he is desiring to reveal himself through to the rest of the world. How do we know that? How do we know that God isn't through with Israel? Well, again, God stated his word so many times in the Old Testament, you know, promises that will, will be revealed. But I think one of the key things is in Romans 11, where Paul, interestingly enough, says, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I, I don't want you to be uninformed concerning this. Concerning what? Well, first of all, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until, and that's a key word, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, until the end of the church age. Blindness, deception, until the church age is finished. And so all Israel will be saved. Whoa. All Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And I firmly believe that. I believe there's coming a day where Israel will recognize Jesus as their savior. And I think it's going to be in the midst of the dark days that lie ahead, the dark days of the tribulation. And they will go through a lot. But God is faithful to his word. And there will be a generation that will one day bear fruits from the nation of Israel. But what about right now? The kingdom of God taken from you and given to a nation. If that nation is made up of the people that God is using right now, which would be the church, can you see where he's desiring that fruit should come forth from the church? All right. If he didn't see any fruit coming forth from Israel, Isaiah 5, Matthew 21, then don't you think he wants to see fruit coming forth out of us? And what does that look like? Again, what, what does the fruit look like? Well, we go back to Isaiah 5. It's righteousness and justice, doing the right thing, being right before God, not oppressing other people. If I were to say to you, how can I know what kind of fruit the Holy Spirit wants to bear in my life, what would you say to me? Where would I look in the Bible for fruit of the Spirit? Good, Galatians. I think that's a great thing because we see what God does within the life of the believer. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Notice it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit that God is doing inside of our lives once we become Christians. So to, to answer the question, should we bear fruit as the people God wants to use, the answer would be yes. What kind of fruit? We have the list for us right here. How do we bear that fruit? It's the spirit that bears it within us. You know what that tells us? We have to be Christians if we're going to bear fruit. The number one thing is we've got to come to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. We've got to put our trust in him. Acknowledge, I'm a sinner. I cannot make it without you. Come into my life, forgive me, and make me the person you want me to be. And that's when he begins doing the work. Now, this is where we get a little bit on the introspective side. And we examine ourselves, as the Bible tells us, to see if we're in the faith. Is there love coming forth from my life? Would I be known as a man of love? And think about it yourself. Don't think of me. or think of you. <laughs> I don't know, Steve. You know? <laughs> Would people refer to you and think of you as, well, you know, he's a loving person. 
Or would it be, you know, he's got a lot of, a lot of hate, anger coming forth from his life. What about joy? Would you be known as a person of joy or a person of, of bitterness? Always seeing the glass half empty, the pessimist as opposed to the optimist. You know what I'm saying? It's not to say that we're always happy and bubbly. Tough things come on, but nothing can rob us of that joy, can it? If Jesus is in our life, there's nothing that can rob us of that joy. Also peace. When the difficulties hit, there is still a peace that passes all human comprehension, amen, amen. that is in our lives, the one who carries us through the storms of life. And that's Jesus in our heart. And so, again, this is good to see. Are these things in my life? You will know them by their fruits. Number one, come to Jesus. Number two, stay with Jesus for fruit to come. That's the ongoing relationship. John chapter 15, where Jesus spoke about him being the vine and we're the branches. And if we're connected to him, guess what? Fruit's going to come. In John 15, 4 and 5, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's pretty cool, isn't it? We come to Jesus, we remain in Jesus. What does that mean? Well, his words, how can his words be inside of me? I read them and abiding in me. I keep them. How do I abide in him? I talk to him. It's a relationship, isn't it? He has saved me. So like earlier this morning, we're we're lifting up our thanks to him. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. We're praising him, aren't we? We're, We're giving him that sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name because of how good he is and what he's done. So we're in relationship with him. And then out of that, the fruit comes. And I believe that's really pleasing to God, really pleasing to him because that's what he wants to see in his vineyard. (laughs) And I need to think about that. The vineyard of the Lord bearing fruit. And so coming to Jesus and abiding in him. Back to Matthew 21. The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And verse 44, whoever falls on this stone, who's the stone? Jesus, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. I think what he's saying here, I mean, it could be the whole thing could be a judgment thing for rejecting him like the religious leaders were doing. But I think we could also see it as whoever falls on this stone, falling in repentance like the tax collectors and the harlots did, will be broken. They won't be coming in pride. Who gave you this authority? But they'll be humble. They'll be broken as they come before him and thus be forgiven. But if they don't, whomever it falls on, there's coming a day when we will stand before God. There's coming a day of judgment. It will grind him to powder. And so throughout this, you know, as we weave our way through it, we can see, can we actually even see Jesus giving those religious leaders an opportunity? It's like one last time, an opportunity to repent, but there, there's such pride there and, and hardness of heart. Now, verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. We're within days right now, you guys, of the crucifixion, within days. So they have no desire for Jesus whatsoever. They're afraid of the people because the people have acknowledged Jesus as their savior. That's why they're going to come at night to arrest him when the crowds are not around. What's the key thing as we look at this? I think the key thing, you guys, is we need Jesus. He is is the name that was given. There is no other name. And then coming to him... Let's look at our lives. Does my life look like the life of a Christian? What does that look like? A life that's bearing fruit. It's a good time to kind of look within and and examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Number one, Jesus. Amen? Amen? If you don't know Jesus and you want to know him, how can I become a Christian? Like those coming to John the Baptist. A baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Repent. Turn from your ways. 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. Stop doing the things you're doing. Come to Jesus and say, I need you. I can't make it on my own. That's how you come. He's our savior. But you got to come to him. So if you'd like to pray to receive him, I'd encourage you to come and pray with us at the close of the service. And we'd love to pray with you. And for the rest of us, let's keep bearing that fruit. Amen? Amen. Letting Jesus shine. Why don't we go ahead and stand? Father, we want to thank you for your word, the life, the richness that it brings to us, the guidance that we need in our life. Lord, and I thank you for those who have come out as we've lifted up our voices together, thanking you and praising you for who you are. And it's awesome to know that you are going to receive the glory both now and forever. And may you be glorified in our lives right now and throughout all of eternity. And Father, we lift up those who are struggling, who are still searching, contemplating, should I come to Jesus? We just pray right now that those blinders would be removed and that they would come broken to you to receive the forgiveness, the strength, the comfort and love that they need. Please go with us now, I pray. May you be honored in our lives in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We're going to close with uh, 404 and Handel. song again whatever may